Good evening, everybody. Um, um, thank you for coming to another one of our uh, Safer at Home series um, with our virtual programming. Um, uh, we want to thank uh, everyone for joining us tonight. Um, uh, that, uh, uh, as well as, uh, um, as you can see, that it's it's not always perfect with technology, but we're getting there. Um, um, so these programs are brought to you. We want to thank our sponsors, uh, Cape Cod Five, First Citizens Federal Credit Union, and Martha's Vineyard Savings for making all these talks possible. Um, we also want to uh, thank uh, Eight Cousins Bookseller um, for uh, um, having all books for all of our talks. Um, please note that these programs are being recorded, um, so you are you are going to be recorded. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you will see a chat menu. If you have a question for the author, what we what we ask you to do is uh, to go into the chat feature, type out your question, and then at the end, we, we will read it. Um, thank you for your support. If you are not currently a member of the Museums on the Green, we encourage you to join by visiting uh, museumsonthegreen.org. Um, and I want to introduce uh, tonight's speaker. Uh, Erica Armstrong Dunbar is the Charles and Mary Beard Professor of History at Rutgers University. Her first book, A Fragile Freedom, African American Women and Emancipation in the Antebellum City was published by Yale University Press in 2008. Her second book, Never Caught, The Washington's Relentless Pursuit of Their Runaway Slave Owned Judge was a 2017 finalist for the National Book Award in nonfiction and a winner of the 2018 Frederick, Frederick Douglass Book Prize. Um, we also wanna let you know that for, um, for this particular talk, um, we, we still want you to go shop at Eight Cousins, but we actually have a copy of the book ourselves. So um, I, I wanna thank uh, Brianna Sharpenberg, who's also in our uh, audience, who helped me put this together, that we actually have this book at, um, in our gift shop. Um, in stock right now, we have it on a special price. So after this talk, if you would like to get a copy, all you gotta do is send an email, email to info at museumsonthegreen.org and we will put one aside for you. You can come right in and get it. If you need it mailed to you, let us know where to mail it. Um, it the price is $20. If there's mailing, we have to charge a little mailing fee, but want to be cognizant of that. So we actually have copies of the book. So without further ado, would you welcome our speaker tonight, Erica Dunbar. Erica, thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me and for uh, helping me transition from computer to computer. Uh, and I, I love actually, although of course I'd prefer to be in front of everyone, um, I, I kind of like seeing folks in their easy chairs and uh, in their dens and um, laying down at least fully clothed, I hope, uh, for most folks in their, in their own rooms and their bedrooms. Um, and so it is actually, in a way, it's, it can be much more intimate than uh, when we perform these kind of Zoom talks. Um, and so I just really want to thank you, um, for, uh, Mark, for making certain that this uh, talk happened, even though we're not face-to-face -face, um, with one another. So I think what I'll do is I'll just sort of jump in um, and I'll give some, some remarks, some comments, and sort of offer a talk about Harriet Tubman, um, and then we'll have time as, as, as we know for, for Q&A. And I actually can't think of a better time to think about Harriet Tubman as someone who fought for freedom uh, even after she had gained her own, uh, and as really, you know, a sort of social justice advocate of the 19th century. We, of course, see on our TV screens um, all day long, uh, sort of what's happening across America, across the globe, to be honest. And I'd argue that, you know, some of the same things that um, people are protesting today, sort of notions about freedom and equality and, and justice, uh, Harriet Tubman protested in, in different ways. So what I'll do is I'll, um, I'll jump in, I'll talk a little, I'll read a little, uh, and then we'll have some, hopefully, some dialogue through, through questions back and forth. So death 
can be a good thing. For the enslaved, the death of an owner could end a decades long reign of terror. A dead owner could no longer use the cat o' nine tails to splay open the flesh of his human property. Nor could he violate the bodies of his enslaved women or children. Sometimes the enslaved prayed or begged for death. And Araminta Ross found herself doing the very same thing. During the early weeks of 1849, Araminta, who was also called Minty, began a prayer vigil. And she was praying for the soul of the man that she called Master. She didn't believe Edward Brodus to be a Christian. And she pleaded with her God for his conversion. She knew that if Brodus accepted God into his life, into his heart, perhaps he would repent for his sins. Perhaps he would become a better man. Perhaps maybe even see his way to offering freedom to her mother or to herself. But in the midst of her prayer vigil, Araminta would have to change course. She would continue to pray, but her prayers reshaped themselves. Rumors spread that her owner was deep in debt and that he planned to sell her and some of her brothers to the lower south, a landscape painted black and white with the expansion of black slavery and white cotton blossoms. Araminta said, quote, I changed my prayer. And I said, Lord, if you ain't never gonna change that man's heart, kill him, Lord, and take him out of the way so he won't do no more mischief, end quote. By March of 1849, Brodus was dead. And Brodus's death meant ruin for a small community of enslaved men and women on the eastern shore of Maryland. They had worked their owner's land in Dorchester County, calling his farm their home. But every enslaved person everywhere understood the fragility of their circumstance. The most fortunate of enslaved people remained close to their family members and their kinfolk and the unlucky ones found themselves ripped from their families. Sold south with the threat of never seeing their loved ones again, Araminta was fortunate. And although her 27 years on earth had been challenging in more ways than imaginable, she had experienced the comfort of growing up knowing two parents, most of her eight siblings, and a new husband. The crevice of happiness carved out by Araminta and her family was soon to be erased as the death of her owner and his unpaid debts brought financial hard times to the farm. Brodus's widow would need to raise money quickly. And there was really only one commodity that would guarantee a windfall of cash, and that was slaves. Araminta had watched her parents deal with the pain of losing three daughters, sold off to the highest bidders. Her family was ruptured, and she knew that the auction block was in her near future. Araminta continued to pray. But now she begged her God to help her find a way to freedom and to reinforce her nerve and her grit and her physical stamina. In the fall of 1849, Araminta and her brothers, Ben and Henry, they escaped from the Poplar Neck Plantation. And by October, Brodus's widow had placed an advertisement in the newspaper for the threesome, offering a reward of up to $100 for each of the runaways. 
and when fear eventually sank its talons into the hearts of her brothers, they returned home to face certain punishment. They all but dragged their sister back to the farm. We don't know the exact moment, but in honor of her mother, Araminta changed her name to Harriet and took her husband's last name, Tubman. Harriet Tubman would become one of America's most wanted fugitives, a woman who risked her life daily to rescue her family members and friends, dozens of friends, really from the clutches of Southern slavery. Every time Tubman traveled on a rescue mission to Maryland, she went with one priority, to save lives. She came to slay and Tubman played no games. Now, while Tubman's name is, it's well known, but I argue that very few people know the kind of intimate details of her life and the perilous journey she traveled to save herself and many of her family members and her friends. Most readers are familiar with Tubman as a conductor on the Underground Railroad, but she was, she was much more. She was a, a textured, 19th century social justice advocate. And with the release of the fe feature film, Harriet, that hopefully some of you've seen, um, that came out in the fall of last year, and the release of She Came to Slay, viewers and readers are introduced to a young woman who lived and loved under the trauma of slavery. We meet a young woman who escaped from slavery and returned to the eastern shore of Maryland at least 13 times. And she did this in order to rescue her family members and her friends. She never once lost a loved one, not on the journey, not to slave catchers, not to illness or death. Tubman's victories are on full display, but one of the things we must also engage with, with her life is the personal loss that she felt and that she encountered. The violence of slavery forced Tubman to leave behind a husband. And upon a return trip to Maryland uh, via the Underground Railroad world, her, her worst fear was confirmed. She had been replaced. She experienced the loss of siblings via the auction block and unnatural death, and she was intimately connected to countless stories of the trauma of slavery. Now, I begin the story of Tubman's life, and she came to slay around 1822. And that's when we believe that uh, Tubman was born. We don't have a record, a, a, a date, an exact date for her birth, which was the case for the majority of enslaved people across the United States. But we believe from, from records that have been pieced together that she was born in or around 1822. I wanted to begin uh, She Came to Slay with really a connect with Tubman and the story of African slavery. And really to begin with the earliest um, traceable African descendant, which was her grandmother. Uh, and toward the end of the 18th century, Tubman's grandmother crossed the Atlantic Ocean via the Middle Passage. She was given the name Modesty and would eventually give birth to Tubman's mother who would become known as Harriet Green. And I'm just gonna read really briefly from the book so you can get a, a sort of feel um, for, well, the way that I write, but also the way that um, I introduce Harriet's grandmother. And this chapter, the beginning of this chapter is called The Alpha Journey. Lying in the belly of a wooden vessel, trying to remember when she had last seen her family. She tried to make sense of the nightmare of her life. It was as if 
she had stumbled into another world. Her eyes never adjusted to the complete darkness in the hold of the ship and the smell of stale urine, feces, rancid vomit, swallowed up the breathable air, leaving her nauseated and short of breath. She grew sick. Dysentery and smallpox were in the air and claimed the lives of the men and women all around her, their dead or dying bodies were dragged to the top deck and callously thrown overboard. Their limbs and torsos would serve as shark bait. Though she managed to escape death, she grew weaker. Rations were limited, so she ate stingy portions of the food often stocked for the enslaved. Peas, yams, corn, and rice. Meat and fish were in short supply and only eaten by the white men who spoke and moved with rage. Modesty was struck by her own transformation. Her legs in particular were weak. So weak, she wondered if they'd even be able to carry her weight or if they would snap and break like dry timber the moment she tried to walk with purpose. If there was one silver lining to her dramatic weight loss, it was that it placed less strain on her aching knees and feet when she was forced to exercise up on the top deck. The less jumping and dancing on demand she had to do, the better. It was useless to try and count how much time had passed. So she waited, waited for death or deliverance, not knowing if they were one and the same. When the ship finally dropped anchor, she disembarked from her voyage, looking like a different person, her thin, and sickly skeletal frame was scarred in more ways than one. Her eyes met with a foreign land filled with strange sights and unfamiliar faces. The pale-faced men who had tortured her and her shipmates, those who had survived and those who had jumped overboard, a not so insignificant act of rebellion, spoke a language that was rough to her ears. She would have to learn this new tongue and she would need to learn it quickly, having arrived in the colony of Maryland, like hundreds of thousands of other men, women and children, she was sold to fuel the engine of American slavery. Her enslaver was a man named Adal Pattison. And once he concluded the purchase, he took her to his farm. He would name her Modesty. Maybe it was in the blink of God's eye. Maybe it took her a lifetime. But eventually she came to understand that she would never again see her homeland or her loved ones. She didn't succumb to whatever grief that knowledge produced. Modesty would do what millions of other enslaved Africans fought to do. She survived. And so I, I begin the book with the story of Modesty, of Harriet's uh, grandmother, in order to connect to sort of not have Harriet just appear out of nowhere as she often does on in history textbooks where she appears in the, the sort of top corner um, of a certain page, an image of her similar to the one that you see in front of you. This is a, a colorized version of a well-known image of, of Harriet Tubman. I had it colorized for, um, for the book in, our, in order, in part, I, I think sort of colorized, I'm, I'm a historian, so I love black and white photos, but I do think that the colorized version gives us a sort of, I don't know, a better sort of understanding of, of who she was, almost as if she were in front of us today. So I begin with um, 
with the story of modesty and move to her mother, Harriet Green. And then I move into the story of, of Araminta as a child. Harriet's name, her, her, the name that she had at birth was Araminta. I'm gonna um, hopefully click us to, and of course this is not working, because there we go. Um, this is, you know, I had an illustrator work with me for this book, in part because there are relatively few images of, of Harriet Tubman, and I'll show some of them to you, photos of her that we have. But really, we have no photos of her from early in her life. And um, I wanted readers to be able to kind of fashion um, a young Minty, a young Araminta. Um, and because we have no, no photos of her, I thought it was important to have an illustrator come on board to kind of give us an idea a visual um, of Araminta. Um, she, Araminta's father was a man named Benjamin Ross, and he, alongside his wife, raised eight children. So she was one of nine, uh, nine children. And while Tubman spent most of her childhood with her parents, she was often hired out uh, to different farms. And that was a practice that began when she was only five years old. So, you know, this is the moment as a historian where I'm looking through the documents and seeing that she's hired out, she's five years old, she's hired out several miles away from her, uh, her mother and her siblings, and she has no bed, she's to sleep on the floor, and it's her duty to empty the muskrat traps uh, of her owner. So, you know, we, we imagine this five-year-old, she probably does not yet have her adult teeth, right? And she is uh, moving around the kind of swampy marshland of the eastern shore of Maryland. For those of you who've been to the eastern shore, you know um, that it actually gets quite cold in the winter and quite hot in the summer. And as a five-year-old, she dealt with um, the, the extremely difficult duties that adults would have to complete given to her as a five-year-old. Um, torn from her mother and her family. She was also tasked with weaving and, and performing uh, domestic work, so house housework, cooking, cleaning. And I, I don't know about you all, but I, I have a 15-year-old a, a who, you know, I'm not leaving any domestic work up to him these days. Uh, I'm sure that uh, any of the cooking and the cleaning, it just would be disastrous. So when we think about uh, also what goes into how physical the work is of washing clothing, in you know the 1830s, um, bringing water from the well, um, gallons and gallons of it, um, lighting fires, making soap out of lye. This is the kind of work that Araminta or a young Harriet uh, was forced to do. And there's this one moment in her life that um, you know, she learns very kind of early to take care of herself. But she, she later on, she, she leaves behind um, a sort of narrated autobiography. Harriet Tubman never learned to write. We believe she learned to read, but she never learned to write. And later on in her life, she told um, of a moment that changed her life. Um, in about 1834, 35, um, Araminta was asked to go on an errand. And she was asked to uh, go down to the, the general store that wasn't too far away. She thought it was uh, something that would happen, you know, sort of everyday task. And on her way, she went and there was a man, an enslaved man, we're not quite certain of his um, status or stature, but he was clearly on the run. He was on the run from an overseer who was chasing him. And all three of these people kind of intersect each other at the general store. And uh, they're all in the store and um, the overseer says to Araminta, she, he commands that she help him kind of grab hold of this man. And Araminta refused. And in that moment of her refusing to do so, the man ran off, he escaped. And the overseer was so angry, he picked up a two pound metal weight and he hurled it in the direction of the, the runaway, but it hit Araminta in her skull. And it literally fractured her skull. She was unconscious, she was bleeding terribly. And this actually changed Araminta's physical life Harry Tubman's life 
from this moment on. She's a teenager at this moment. After she comes to, she's forced to work in the fields quickly, but she deals with um, seizures and um, terrible headaches for the rest of her life. And we don't often look at, at Harriet Tubman through the lens of a disabled person, but she was indeed that. She struggled with this for the rest of her life. But with this struggle also came this, um, what she called a deep connection to God. She said that God helped her see things, that he gave her visions. And for those of you who've seen the movie, this plays out in the, the film, Harriet, as well. But she argued that he would give her um, sort of direct knowledge about things that were to happen um, to her, things that could be bad, which way to move, which way to go. And she followed this advice for the rest of her years. So although this was a sort of tragic and difficult moment um, in her life, one that left her physically ailing, um, it was also one that she attributed to her closeness with her religion and her God. She grew up on the Eastern shore of Maryland. She was a small woman in stature, barely um, just over five feet tall. And when her owner died, as I talked about in the beginning of my talk, she was um, basically because of her illness, because of her inability to work sometimes, she was headed uh, directly to the auction block and it was um, really in the, the, as I said, the fall of 1849 that she makes the decision to run off. Um, this actually, what I'm showing on the screen now, is the actual runaway ad that was placed um, for Araminta and her two brothers, Henry, which they, who they name Harry here, uh, and Ben. Um, just so that we can see what this advertisement actually looked like in 1849. This is the first one. And oftentimes when we think about Tubman running off, it's always sort of with the idea that she ran off by herself and that was it. Well, actually, no. Her first attempt at running away was with her two brothers. And they um, decided to abandon um, this notion of running off and return to the farm and then Harriet Tubman made her sort of feigned escape. And I think one of the moments, at least in the film, um, that is beautifully portrayed um, is the moment that she arrives in Pennsylvania. And in the, in the book, I, um, I offer the quote that she um, gives later on in her life. She says when she crosses the border into Pennsylvania into free territory, she says, quote, there was no one to welcome me to the land of freedom. I was a stranger in a strange land and my home was all down in Maryland because my father, my mother, my brothers and sisters and friends were there, but I was free and they should be free, end quote. And so she's, she's really asking this question, what does freedom mean when slavery is still intact? And this is the moment that she is prompted to make this, this decision that she's gonna go back for her family. And, and sometimes, you know, people think they know Harriet Tubman, but they don't. She really just goes back to the Eastern Shore of Maryland, not sort of all over the South, kind of scooping folks up. But she, we know that she made at least 13 trips back and forth and that she rescued between 60 and 70 people over uh, something about it, like a 10 year period. She would come to Philadelphia uh, during, when she first escaped, she would come to Philadelphia, she'd work as a domestic in Philadelphia and Cape May, New Jersey uh, for vacationers on the beach. Um, she would save her money and then she would use that money to basically fund these trips back and forth to the eastern shore of Maryland. And she rescued all of her family, with the exception of one sister who, who died before, um, in the fall of, of 1860, um, Harriet Tubman's last trip back to the eastern shore of Maryland. And typically, you know, this is, this is the life we only know about this sort of short period of her on the underground. But that was, you know, she, she escaped in 1849 and her last attempt down um, to travel to Maryland was 1860. So it's about an 11 year period, but she lived until her 90s, right? And she had a rich and complex life 
um, in which she did many things. She fought for many things. And I have a, a few images I want to show you. This, once again, I don't have a photo of when she actually rescues her elderly parents uh, and worked with the illustrator to kind of capture the description that um, that uh, Harriet offered in her own um, narrated autobiography. That you know she basically had a rickshaw kind of created to carry her parents who could not walk from the eastern shore of Maryland to uh, Philadelphia. Uh, and so once again, this is a, a reminder that she's going back and forth for her family and for her loved ones. Um, I wanted to show this image. Some of you might be familiar with it. This actually is the earliest known photo of Tubman around 1868, so after the Civil War. For those of you who've been to the African American Museum down in DC, the new museum, Smithsonian Museum, this is actually on display. And it just was um, a year ago, it, it was um, put on display, it was in a private collection for some time. But now we know that this is the earliest known photo of her um, that's in, in circulation. Um, and so if you have a chance to go to the museum when things reopen, um, it's a great um, image of her, in part because it's somewhat dim different from the images that we typically have of Tubman, right? Kind of like the first image I showed, um, elderly, um, head covered, kind of hands clasped. This is definitely a different kind of image um, that we have of Tubman as a, a younger uh, woman. Um, also, I wanted to uh, share this image that we also know, this photo, um, which is held at the Library of Congress, is another image of Tubman, probably a little bit later. Um, we don't have the exact date, sometime between 1871 to 1876 after, once again, all of these images are after um, the Civil War. And that's another part of, of Harriet's story that so few people know, that after she had gone back and forth and rescued nearly 70 people, the governor of Massachusetts approached Harriet Tubman and asked her if she would be willing to support the Union Army. This is in 1863, so midway through the war, if she'd be willing to go down to South Carolina and to serve as a spy and a scout, because clearly she was someone who could do that kind of work. And she went down to um, South Carolina. She's still technically a fugitive. And she basically joins with the Union Army. She's the first woman to ever lead a military expedition um, ever in our nation's history. And she's engaged in um, with the Kambahi River Raid in June of 1863, where she ends up emancipating over 700 enslaved people. So these are the, some of the things that we don't, as I said, know um, about Tubman. And you know, as I start to wrap up so we can move to q and I also love these images and I wanted you all to see them because we don't think about Tubman as a, as a wife and as a mother. And um, this is an image of her on, on the left, um, taken in Auburn, New York. And um, it's a picture of her and her husband, uh, who is sitting um, to the right of her, sitting down on the chair, uh, Nelson Davis, and um, her adopted daughter, Gertie. Um, Oftentimes we don't think about Tubman as a woman who after the Civil War, after freedom was granted, was able to piece together a life to herself, for herself. And um, she did so with marriage and motherhood. And I think that's really important to think about that, that Tubman, as I said, is a textured and nuanced person. Um, one of the, the sort of, um, this is actually another image, a rare image that I actually, I think this is the first time in my book that it's published, uh, that came out of a newspaper in the 20th century in 1905, um, when she had gone to pay her respects um, to another Union, soul, union officer. Um, and I believe uh, that uh, from the Boston Athenaeum is where I, I found this image. And finally, to sort of think about her as an elderly woman. Her social activism did not stop. 
Um, she worked after slavery was over, she worked uh, feverishly to help women um, gain the vote. So she was a suffragist. And um, she also worked terribly hard to create uh, a home for elderly, formerly enslaved black men and women. She worried about their ability to take care of themselves. Uh, slavery was over, but still uh, so many were impoverished. So she, she helped to create really one of the first um, homes for um, elderly black men and women. And I'll end with this um, slide that very few people have seen, which is the, um, her line in state. Um, we know that she, um, she dies in March of 1913 in, in her 90s. And um, that surrounded, she's surrounded by uh, a group of black club women in New York who raised a tremendous amount of money in order for her to have a decent burial and a decent um, headstone. Because one thing to remember is that Tuppen remained um, impoverished for the majority of her life. And what I'll say in conclusion is that I wanted in She Came to Slay to show a woman of action, a woman who dedicated her life to social justice. And it's really a privilege um, to share her story in a way that I hope is accessible and kind of filled with strength and courage. So thank you for, um, for listening um, and I think now is the time, right, for us to move into some Q and A. Do you, shall I leave my screen up? Is that best? That, that's fine. Okay. Um, if if you've got any questions for Erica, like I said, down at the bottom of your screen, there's a, there's a chat feature. Um, um, Erica, I, I got a question. Your your book it literally starts with an author's note that is just absolutely unbelievable. And your first paragraph starts off about how um, uh, Harriet Tubman, in her 70s, purportedly goes to Mass General to get surgery on, on this injury that she's been carrying around since a two-pound weight hit her in the head. Could, could you talk about that? Yeah, you know, this is, as a, a historian, sometimes you, co you come across documents sometimes that really are fantastic, and then sometimes you're kind of like, well, I don't understand the story, but supposedly, and this is not necessarily told through, um, directly through Harriet, but according to reports, she um, went to Mass General, because she had been struggling with terrible headaches, um, debilitating headaches, and she went there and supposedly um, asked for and was given brain surgery. And so we have to remember that this is a moment where medicine is still developing. Um, and according to uh, the accounts, she underwent brain surgery without anesthesia. And she supposedly bit down, um, similar to what she saw her Civil War, um, the soldiers that she helped care for as a nurse in, in the Civil War, that she, you know, she simply bit down, I believe it was a belt or a bullet, and she um, uh, had her surgery. And then supposedly got up, put her bonnet on, and left. And that she supposedly passed out on the street. So now this is like part of the storytelling around um, Harry Tubman. This was a fairly well-known story about her. But as a historian, you know, I have to ask this question. Well, A, why does this, why do we need this story about her courage and strength in one in which that's probably inaccurate, right? When we think about, I mean, how many people are having brain surgery and then popping up put, without anesthesia and putting on a bonnet and then, you know, leaving? Um, probably no one. And also, but I asked myself, why would this story even be necessary. And I wonder why there's this like flourish about her when she, her, the, the story that we know is accurate is almost unimaginable on its own that she returned back, went back and forth to the Eastern shore of Maryland 13 times. Why this story about brain surgery? And part of it I believe is because Tumman didn't necessarily believe that she would be remembered, that she would be known 
Um, and so perhaps this was uh, an attempt to become more well known. Perhaps I believe it was um, the attempts of her friends around her uh, that wanted her to be more well known. But, you know, we actually don't need a story about brain surgery to know just how courageous and fantastic and brave Harriet Tubman really was. Okay, there's like two questions in one here. Um, could you describe how she actually um, smuggled slaves out and, and, uh, and, and were able to rescue slaves? And actually then uh, following up that, how did you come up with the title? Yeah. Um, so uh, let me go in reverse. I'll come up, I'll talk about the title first, which is, you know, we wanted very much, and my editor kind of approached me about writing this book. We knew the film, the biopic, was coming out in November of 2019, and we wanted really to write something that was, could sort of be a companion piece to the film, that the film only captures a short window of her life, that, that like 11, 12 years. And what I wanted to do was for have, to have people know much more about her. You know, she's, she's born in 1822 and dies in 1913. She lives 50 years after the Civil War, right? And so, but we wanted, I wanted very much to write something that would be accessible um, and that would also play to younger generations of readers. Um, and so this title, She Came to Slay, um, is really a title, uh, a sort of phrase that I extracted right out of pop culture. Um, so for, for any, if there are any Beyonce fans, um, it's a phrase that she's used, that she said, and other entertainment um, figures that when you're referring to a, a woman, in particular a Black woman, but any woman who's um, kind of doing her job or um, kind of handling her business in a way that is incredible and complete, then the phrase, you know, that's been used before is, oh, she came to slay. So it's not necessarily a reference to the fact that she's also, she's holding a pistol in um, this illustration. And we do know that Tubman carried a pistol. She should have. She was going in and out of slave territory um, all of the time. But that's how I sort of came up with the title. That was an attempt to make a connection between readers across generations with the history in the book and um, the title. Now, the way that she would actually come to slay or actually do her work on the underground, um, you know, it varied and it was it was different. So as I said. She would, she liked to actually lead her expeditions during the winter, which is somewhat different from most um, escapes. Most runaways actually use the spring and summer to most fugitives, um, in part because it was easier to travel. There's no snow, there's no ice, there's um, more that's edible when we think about vegetation or animals that can be trapped and hunted for this, you know, 100 mile or 150 mile journey um, to the Pennsylvania state line. And so um, she actually did something different, which is she would work, as I said, in the summertime as a domestic. She was a, a maid and a cook and save her money. And she would, in this kind of incredible way, she often took the train down back down south back towards maryland because who's looking for a fugitive on a, on a train heading back into the south absolutely no one right and so she would travel often by train into delaware and then through her sort of anonymous stops on the underground she would walk she would um have wagons that uh, knew who were part of the underground that would take her. There was a great deal of walking. And so the money that she actually made in the summer times and, and winter and spring rather, she would use for several things. She would buy shoes because often the enslaved did not have shoes and would not be able to make a hundred mile journey by foot, right? So she would bring shoes and clothing and uh, appropriate clothing for the winter. And she would also use that money to pay people off who would help her um, uh, rescue folks. And she became somewhat of a legend and she would sometimes use music. She would sing um, sort of calls. People were kind of always on the lookout for her. She, she was known as the Black Moses. Um, and um, as I said before, it was her family and friends who she rescued. 
And so there was a deep connection between her family and friends and members of the underground who would, who would get notes to them, who would pass on information to tell them, Harriet's coming, it's going to be this month, be on the lookout. And then she would literally go and take them just about out of the fields. Um, and they would make their way often by night in the winter um, to Pennsylvania. Now, by 1850, that became tricky because there was more of an enforcement upon the Fugitive Slave Act, right, that came out in 1850. And so after 1850, she begins shuttling people to Pennsylvania, but then to Canada. So she relocates her entire family to St. Catharines, Canada, which is, and oftentimes that was by train, um, and sometimes by wagon, and sometimes by foot. But we have to remember there's also this kind of loose underground that travel that really exists from Maryland and yeah, actually into Virginia and some places in North Carolina, but all the way up through the northern states into Canada. And so that's that was her um, her technique. Her last trip to Maryland was in the fall of 1860. So at this moment that that Abraham Lincoln is elected president, and when the the word the nation appears to be kind of spinning out of control, she makes this last trip to try and get her sister Rachel who couldn't and wouldn't leave. She had two children, young children, and she didn't want to leave them behind. And this was the last trip Harriet felt like she could make before something like the war would happen. But when she, she arrived uh, in Maryland, she was too late and, and Rachel, Rachel had died. Um, another two-prong question here. Uh, what source material did you use to, when researching her grandmother Mm -hmm. And does she have any current descendants? So, uh, and I'll go the reverse again. So she's got lots of descendants. Descendants who are, for the majority, kind of in three places. Some still on the eastern shore of Maryland. Um, some, a good number in Auburn, New York, right? Because that is where Harriet Tubman settles. Um, in um, After she, she leaves Maryland and, and she's, kind of going back and forth on the Underground Railroad, she's, she's eventually given a, a home in Auburn, New York, and she would move most of her family there, but also in Canada. So there are actually a good number of um, Tubman um, descendants, some of whom go around, um, uh, sort of offer lectures. And I went down to the Harriet Tubman um, conference that they have usually once a year, not this year, but I went down, um, I guess it was last summer, last June, and it was, I believe, her great, maybe it was her great, great niece who came um, to give a talk kind of about the family and um, sort of more intimate details about, about Tubman. And I used, you know, in terms of my research, I'd, I'd say there's still there, there are some records behind uh, that were left behind the wills of her former owners. Um, but also Harriet Tubman left a, as I said, she didn't write her own autobiography or narrative, but she narrated it or she um, spoke, uh, had conversations with the writer. So we have her words, right? Which when we think about Find, piecing together the lives of the enslaved, especially those who were not literate or at least could not write, it's terribly difficult because we're often left without their, without having their voice. And thankfully, um, Tubman left behind her voice. But even, you know, I had a, an image up, um, a clip of a marriage announcement, right, in the newspaper when she married Nelson Davis. Those are the kinds of primary sources that I used to help weave this, this story together. Okay. Um, what, um, how close did she ever come to being captured? And a uh, follow up to that is there's a Harriet Tubman house in Boston. What's her connection to Boston? Yeah. So she, she notes in her own um, uh, autobiography that she, there were a couple of times there were close calls. Once she was on a train and headed uh, south and there was a friend of her former owner who was on the train who would have recognized her. And she, she uh, explains how she basically hid behind a newspaper 
and you know she opened up the newspaper as if she were reading it now you know there's some danger in that because at that point eric Tubman could not read and so I hope, I'm assuming the newspaper was in the right direction um, because uh, she could not have read it, but she hid behind um, the newspaper in order to avoid him. There were times uh, during the actual escapes, several times, where she was very close to um, capture. And she would, she sometimes would have visions and um, she always argued that God showed her the way. She never took credit for it. That was, she really saw herself as a servant leader. She was a, a deeply religious woman. And she would listen to the visions that she reported to, to have had um, and to outmaneuver um, on these 13 trips back and forth. So um, yeah, there were, there were close calls. Now Boston was one of the places, one of the locations where she um, would travel on this kind of uh, abolitionist circuit. So we know there was a deep uh, presence of abolitionists in Massachusetts. And many of them were friendly with Tubman. And this is while she's a fugitive. And so there were other ways after 1850 when the laws became uh, extremely difficult. She, and she, once she moved up towards Auburn, New York, she started kind of traveling the circuit, telling her story speaking at abolitionist meetings and some of the times it would be in Boston and it was always under a pseudonym because she could still be captured and taken back to the eastern shore of Maryland but she had a, a deep connection to Boston abolitionists um, who helped support her and her trips back and forth and as I said it was the the mayor uh, rather the governor of Massachusetts that knew her well enough and knew her story well enough to say, hey, I think we should pull, we should, if you would be so kind, we would like to use your, um, your uncanny abilities in this fight um, in the Civil War. Yeah, you point out in your book too that she's, uh, she was friends with people like Frederick Douglass and John Brown and, and kind of polar opposites. But uh, uh, one more two-part question. Um, uh, did, did she have any biological children? And there's a picture of her with her parents. What's in her hand? Is that a pistol? Yeah. Um, let me see if I can get us to that. Yeah. So there's the the image. Um, we know, and and part of the reason we have this, uh, once again, we have a pistol in in her hands. Is in part I, I was interest, want, interested interested in, in really fashioning Harriet Tubman in a kind of accurate way and um she she didn't just pray her way out of <laughs> maryland up to to pennsylvania that she understood the 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 danger uh, and that she carried um her gun especially with her parents who it took them longer to travel um they couldn't um it, it was harder to hide with them than with some of her other escapes uh, or other fugitives that she helped to escape um, and in terms of biological children, no, we, there's no record of her ever having biological children, um, not with, um, so, so Tubman was married twice. Um, she, her first husband was John Tubman, uh, who she married in 1844 at, in the Eastern Shore of Maryland. He actually was a free black man. She was enslaved, he was free. And so their marriage was not considered legal under the law but they were married for five years when she um, escaped. After, um, after her escape and after many years, she would marry Nelson Davis, who was actually 20 years younger than Harriet Tubman. Um, and he had actually served as in, in the colored troops in, um, in the Civil War. And um, we're not quite sure if their paths crossed while, during the war because he did spend um, sometime in, in the Deep South, but um, she would marry him. And so on Harriet Tubman's gravestone, on her headstone, her name is Harriet Tubman Davis. She went by Mrs. Davis at the end of her life. Another thing that most people don't kind of think about is that she was a married woman. She, they had no biological children, but she had a, an adopted child. And um, 
that marriage and family was deeply important to her. We had a question with this image up. Um, how did she escape with two older people in a rickshaw? <laughs> Doesn't it sound crazy? Doesn't it sound like how on earth could that have happened? Um, and in part because uh, they were unable to do the kind of physical um, walking through the, the, the marshes the way that maybe younger fugitives could. Um, they traveled at night. They traveled at night. And one thing to note is that when she actually um, leads her parents to, to freedom, her, hus her, her father, remember, he actually, well, actually, you don't know. You haven't read the book yet, but you'll know. And I don't want to give it all away. But um, he and her mother eventually earn their freedom. I won't tell you how, but um, they eventually earn their freedom. So when she's leaving, when she's leading them out of the Eastern Shore, she's not taking fugitives. She's taking um, a man and a woman who um, were elderly. And so less, um, there was less value attached to their bodies. And that's just simply what we see with enslavement, that elderly people were often considered troublesome or a nuisance or um, because they did not bring in um, income. And so perhaps people's guards were down a little bit more because they were elderly, but she did it. And she knew the roads to, to keep, to stick to. She knew the times to travel. And she also, as I said, had a, a network of people who with covered wagons would take her and her, her parents um, eventually to Philadelphia. And there's this moment when she gets, they get to Philadelphia and her parents meet the famed abolitionist William Still who kept a, a, a volume of names um, called journal, he kept, he called it the Journal C. Um, and it's actually, you can see it, it's at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, where he wrote in the names of all the fugitives that passed through his office that he helped um, hide and uh, get employment. And so when her parents arrive, and her, as her siblings had, um, they change their name. And they don't go by, um, the Ross name anymore. They adopt the name Stuart. And so they hide in on as well as her siblings in the north and in Canada in part by changing their names. Well, I want to thank you for joining us tonight. This has been fascinating. Um, as I mentioned at the top of the hour, if you'd love a copy of the book, we, we've actually got the copies of it. This is one time that Eight Cousins um, is not selling it. We are directly. So if you're interested in a copy, please uh, email us at info at museumsonthegreen.org or, or at info at fmog.org and we, we will set it up for you. You can buy it right in our gift shop. We're not open yet, but we have copies of the book. So thank you. Erica, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Yeah. Um, everyone, I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, I want to stay, uh, remain safe, remain healthy. Uh, our next talk is tomorrow night at 7. Uh, thank you, everybody, and uh, we'll hopefully see you tomorrow night. <laughs> thank you, Erica. Thank you.